not true capitals, <laughs> real people. I'm sorry we are a few minutes late because in principle, you know, technology is always something special. Uh, we should be connected with Morocco because, you know, we are partner with the uh, OCP of Rabai and uh, the president should speak with welcome remark after me, but, you know, we'll see if it works. Otherwise, we'll do things in a different way. Uh, so, again, good afternoon, welcome to everybody, and we wish you a very good time attending this conference today, Arab geopolitics, as we call it. Uh, some of you may be surprised, I'm sure, by the fact that we have chosen to hold a real event with real people present in the room, as I just said. After months of segregation uh, and only the, fre the frequent use of web, we have been used to that mode for the past months, but we thought that to go back to a normal practice would be a signal of resilience and goodwill. We have taken the habit of holding every year since the beginning of the foundation, every year an event dedicated to the Arab region. And we want to continue this tradition. This is why we are here today, in fact. Even in difficult times, when many countries, Arab countries, are still closed, as you know, so that there will be not many speakers from the region, unfortunately, and the presence of the speakers cannot be assured. This is the reason why you will listen to some virtual presentations. In any case, today we are lucky to have been able to assemble in this room so much expertise, and I warmly thank the moderators and the speakers who have accepted our invitation to Rome, rather courageously perhaps, but they will be rewarded, I hope. Since its beginning, the NATO College Foundation has a strong focus on Arab affairs that we see as a priority for us to be addressed in the best possible way. There are very good reasons, I think, to continue to be interested in the region. Its strategic interest is evident before our eyes, but it is not only for that. There is also a rich humanity, full of history, and living close to our shores, hoping for a better future. This subject is a complex one, as you all know, and can be discussed from very different perspectives. To summarize, our final objective would be to see what we call an arc of crisis to be transformed into an arc of opportunities. And this part of the world has, in fact, an enormous potential for opportunity. Unfortunately, potential for the time being, I'm afraid. It is also clear that we have in front of us a vast area that is impossible to resume in simple formulas. Each country has its own history, its own tradition, expectations, its special position, and therefore deserves a special attention. Our intention in convening this conference is to look forward beyond present crisis and turmoil, looking for possible avenues, to discuss about cooperative solutions. This is not an easy matter, and we need more than ever a clever analysis based on a good reading of facts. A further complexity, as you know, is given by the fact that national governments are no more the only actors on the international scene. We see non-state entities and pressure groups being active almost everywhere, and the Arab region is no exception. We live in a fragmented and multi-layered reality, asking for a special effort from us. I think that in conclusion, and we say it every time we speak about the subject, it is for the Arabs to take their destiny in their hands and to decide about their own future. But at the same time, we wish to extend a friendly hand in good faith in order to offer support. So we are here today to provide a basis for an honest and high-level discussion, as usual, in a spirit of mutual understanding and on a scientific basis. Our foundation was established in 2011 with the ambition to be able to connect with a larger audience on strategic issues and not only with specialists. And for this reason, we have produced various books related to our studies. It has taken a lot of efforts to organize this event in such difficult times as the present ones, and I would like to thank the director and the staff of the foundation for all their work. 
Special thanks for all those who have encouraged us and supported us in taking this decision. First of all, the NATO Political and Security Division and Philip Morris International. Many thanks are also due to our active partner, the Policy Center for the New South of Rabat and uh, its president, Karim. Thanks again to our speakers and moderators, and Professor Capel is going to open the discussion after the welcome remark. I wish everybody an interesting and fruitful afternoon. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Karim, if you are there, you can speak, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. So, buongiorno. Thank you, Benvenuto and Rizzo and my friend. Uh, this is uh, a pleasure to be, uh, to be joining you uh, from Morocco, and I'm glad that you have been able to get uh, together for this important meeting. Uh, first, I would like to congratulate uh, you, uh, Ambassador Minato, for all your efforts and all the work you've been doing uh, with the, the NATO Foundation. And you've been continuing despite uh, you know, all difficulties among the years, and I think you should be congratulate, uh, congratulated for that, and also your staff uh, for having you know, a constant and resilient and persistent investment in dialogue. And I think that's my first message. Uh, at a time where we don't know, and nobody knows how the future is going to evolve, uh, these are uncertain times, there's no uh, you know, certain way ahead, particularly in the region we are looking at uh, in this conference. Um, so many uncertainties, so many parameters, so many actors uh, with uh, very different strategies, so many external influences, so many complex internal dynamics that no one can tell what's going to happen. Uh, I would, and I think you should be congratulated for you know, continuing to investigate these topics. So my first message is about uh, the younger generation within this context. Uh, we at the Policy Center, a young institution, we started six years ago. Um, we are now about 100 people, 70% uh, of which are researchers. Um, and we care about two things. The first one, and I think it's very relevant in the discussion we will be having together here today. The first one is the North-South rebalancing. How to fundamentally, uh, and, and I'm waiting my words, fundamentally transform the way we exchange, the way we dialogue and the understanding of each other. It's very important. I think Africa and the southern part of the Mediterranean um, is in a situation where the need for dialogue is, has never been as important as of today. And again, here, the work you're doing, Ambassador, with your foundation is essential, because I think this can only be solved through dialogue and understanding. And the work of think tanks like the Policy Center, like the Foundation, is essential in, the, in this perspective. Uh, and so that's the North-South rebalance, where um, as equal partners, as people of, of values, tolerance, openness, belief in fact-based, evidence-based policy making, are trying to create space and platforms for that dialogue to happen beyond official channels, which have the limitation we we'll all know. The second rebalancing we're trying to foster and to work on is intergenerational rebalancing, to give more space to the next generation, and it's particularly important in the dialogue and in any solution that will emerge 
In a world that I don't like very much, which you call the Arab world, as you know, Morocco has a specific perspective about the Arab world. Morocco is not only an Arab country, but it's a, a mixture of Africans and Berbers and Arabs, and, you know, Mediterraneans, etc. So, but this is semantics. <laughs> but I think what is important here is to give more space to the younger generation. And how do you do that? We have several instruments, and dialogue is one, I mentioned it. Uh, another one is through young leadership uh, programs, activity, which we do at the Policy Center, which is for me very important, because after all, uh, this is their world, the next generation. You know, people under 30 or 35, so go just to simplify the discussion. And I think it's a very important aspect of the of the work we do as, uh, as think tank and to be a fundamental and essential part of any sort of solutions uh, for this region that has been living uh, you know, in a sort of turmoil uh, since, uh, since the last uh, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 years. Uh, I come from a country which has been uh, uh, you know, quite uh, you know, well managed and where we have uh, uh, you know, serious policies and they and stability, but we also, of course, care for our neighborhood, which is uh, the eastern side of us, which is, has been living uh, in a difficult situation, such as in Libya, of course, and, uh, and Syria, not to mention, of course, other countries, such as uh, Yemen, for example. Uh, <coughs> so what I can tell you, us, as think tanks, as people of you know, working in research, uh, with a passion for peace, for tolerant dialogue, for fact-based analysis and uh, evidence-based policy making. Uh, what I can tell you, our contribution is really to open space, to over-communicate, to multiply the channels of communication so we can understand each other. And uh, that's what we can do, us as think tanks or uh, you know, the NATO Foundation as a, also a think tank. And this is where we meet with you. And this is where we have a convergence, and this is where we provide those platforms uh, to be able to find out solutions, because in the end, only dialogue can find out solutions in, this, uh, you know, in the various difficult situations that, that we are living in, in, the, uh, uh, in this region, and particularly, uh, we need to have all the actors reveal their preferences. And through dialogue, you cannot hide, if you multiply dialogue, multiple interactions, you cannot hide. You have to tell what is in your mind, and you can reveal the, you know, the players, the objective the of functions of the players, so they reveal their preferences, and we can build on that uh, uh, solution. And I believe that you know, civil society is an essential component of any solution uh, in the region. And my concluding point will be about Europe and the region. And I think uh, Europe is a central partner, is a long-standing partner, is a trusted partner of the region, and particularly uh, the Mediterranean, but I will extend it to Africa. And here, I think this is the same kind of issue. We need to you know, uh, sort of change the dynamics and intensify dialogue on very important issues that are of importance for domestic politics in many countries, such as migration, for instance, in, in European uh, uh, societies, but also the issue of economic growth, inequality, changing labor markets, you know, challenges ahead. So, unfortunately, I have no solution to offer to you, but what I have uh, is uh, the commitment of institutions like us to create platforms with, uh, in front of the highly complex matters that we are facing and the high in uncertainty we are facing, create the platforms that will enable us to discuss and to exchange and to be able together to, to have solutions, not a solution forever, it doesn't exist, but permanent channels of dialogues, permanent frameworks, permanent institutions, uh, so as to uh, come up uh, with, uh, you know, policies, solutions, agreements, treaties, whatever they are, that, uh, you know, 
have the potential to improve uh, the, fu the, the future path of, our, of nations. And uh, I think we're all being challenged. Uh, middle classes in advanced economies are challenged by robotization, by the changing dynamics of globalization, by aging populations. On the African continent, we have other sorts of challenges, of course, economic growth, inequality as well, labor market, youth unemployment. So there's plenty, plenty of topics where we can find our solutions uh, together. But again, I think the current state of dialogue in general, and dialogue in the Socrates you know, notion of things, you know, in the uh, anti-Greece way of uh, seeing what is dialogue about, is suboptimal uh, today. And this is exactly why we are strongly committed to the partnership we are having with the NATO Foundation in Rome, and in general with partners, because we believe in the virtues of dialogue to find solution to very complex problems that are challenging us and the rest of the world. Many thanks again, and it's a really great pleasure to partner with you Ambassador, in this event. Thank you very much, uh, Karim. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry that you are not here with us. We'll try to do better next time. <laughs> but there is a limit to our uh, capacity. We have been investigating almost every week if the flights from Rabat <laughs> or Casablanca or Badakai were open. And the answer was always negative, so uh, too bad. Anyway, thank you very much for being with us today. We're very, very grateful for that. Have a good time. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And now, Colonel Huber, the NATO Defense College. Thank you, Ambassador. It's a privilege for me to be here. It's a privilege to see some uh, some familiar faces and friends of the NATO Defense College. Um, I am here on behalf of the Dean of the NATO Defense College, Dr. Stephen Mariano, and our new Commandant. For those who know the NATO Defense College, you know we just recently went under a, a change of Commandant, uh, Lieutenant General Chris Whitecross, uh, just returned to Canada and is planning on retirement. And we welcomed Lieutenant General Olivier Rittemann, a uh, French officer most recently from came, coming from SHAPE. So we're under new leadership at the college, and it's a, it's a pleasure for us to partner with the NATO Defense College Foundation and with the Policy Center for the New South with this, this event. Uh, the, the region continues to be a topic of great interest for the college and uh, an impetus for some new initiatives as well. Uh, even with the challenges of COVID-19, we continue to entertain and receive requests for visit exchanges and academic exchanges with, uh, with uh, entities in, in the region. A few of the more notable activities at the NATO Defense College in the future include a modular short course, which is patterned after a one week of our flagship senior course at the ICI Center in Kuwait. We also have an initiative for a Gulf Week in the future, which is patterned after the NATO Defense College Kiev Week, which is kind of an exported week of our, of our senior course, a kind of a standalone course that has been very successful in Kiev. Um, we've also undergone a recent test and trial structure at the college in which we've enjoyed the, uh, the participation of an officer from the ICI, uh, captain Nasser Marafi, uh, a Kuwaiti Navy captain, and we have uh, included a request for a med dialogue officer in which we'll put the NATO Defense College more in line with the NATO, headqu NATO headquarters strategic partnership framework and allow us to more fully engage with, uh, with partners in the region. So these are just a, a few examples to highlight the interest that the NATO Defense College has in the region and why it's in addition to those that have been mentioned already and why it is important for us to, um, to, to partner and, and help, 
sponsor with uh, events like this one. So on behalf of the NATO Defense College Dean and new Commandant, uh, let us add our uh, NATO Defense College welcome to you to the, and hope you very much enjoy this conference. Thank you. According to our liturgy, uh, this word, <laughs> we all have our own liturgies. This was the, <laughs> in a way or in another, <laughs> uh, this was the welcome remarks, but the real conference is starting now, and Professor Capel will be the first speaker opening, opening the afternoon. So, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, lecture. I'm very impressed by the number of people attending. I thought that uh, the survivors from COVID-19 would be much fewer in number. And uh, it's glad to see that there are still some uh, real people around. Uh, I would also like to extend my uh, salute to uh, Karim in uh, Morocco and as he mentioned, that his country was pluricultural and dimensional, so I'll say Ahlen and Azul and Bonjour uh, from far away. And um, um, well, even though I'm, uh, in, I was introduced in the in brochure as uh, someone who uh, professes out of Switzerland in Lugano, which I proudly do, I'm also a French citizen, something I cannot hide even with my accent in English. And um, as you know, when uh, we deal with the challenges of the Mediterranean and the Middle East nowadays, definitely there is a big issue with NATO itself. Uh, on Friday, 24th of July, in a NATO country, Turkey, the uh, former museum and former, former Byzantine uh, church and cathedral of uh, Hagia Sophia, Saint Sophie, was returned into a mosque. Uh, and uh, President Erdogan attended the prayers, and the, the imam carried a saber, a cimitero, with him, uh, because he just wanted to emulate uh, Sultan Mehmed Fatih, uh, the conqueror of Constantinople on the 26th of May, 1453. And uh, in what is called in Turkish, Kilic Hakki, which is the right of the saber, i.e. a place which has been conquered for Islam by the saber cannot be given away if not by the saber. And this mix of religion and, uh, and military is, of course, something which is a real issue that we have to understand. This is probably part and parcel of the, of the new, should we say, post-COVID uh, geopolitics of this watershed year 2020, which, as we know, saw and is still seeing in uh, the very day we're speaking, uh, even a country like Morocco is, uh, has had to take uh, very severe measures to uh, restrict um, uh, travel between a number of, uh, of Moroccan cities, of major Moroccan cities, which have been locked down. And, um, but this is also a year which started with a major military incident, something which did not really follow the traditional ways and views of the military confrontation, the termination or vaporization of Brigadier General Qasem Soleimani, who was uh, visiting Baghdad, probably in order to put down the Iraqi Shia insurgency uh, against the Iranian uh, plundering of their resources 
of their uh, oil resources by, uh, by a U.S. drone. And uh, this is also a year that saw the oil market crash. Uh, the uh, barrel went to an unheard of low because uh, the value of the barrel someday in late April went down to minus $36 a barrel. You would pay $36 for someone to take away a barrel of oil from you. Even though it has uh, gone up again and is more or less stabilizing around $40 for the time being, nevertheless, this means that uh, trillions of dollars are going to miss in uh, the budget of the Gulf states that uh, Ambasciatore Minuti mentioned earlier on uh, with uh, unforeseen consequences. Uh, how are uh, the oil exporting country going to manage? Uh, what are they going to have to cut down in terms of financing of subsidies, not only for themselves, but also for a whole Middle East Mediterranean region, which has functioned uh, since the October 1973 war also known as the Yom Kippur War or the Ramadan War, according to your religious preferences, which has largely lived on remittances from oil money. This is a sea change, if I may say so, uh, as we're close to the NATO naval base in uh, Naples. And uh, this is still very unpredictable. Uh, I believe that uh, we now have to, uh, to reorganize our way of thinking. And I'm, I'm very pleased that the, uh, the NATO uh, Defense College uh, opportunately uh, decided to take that into its hands because uh, we need to rethink NATO's role in the region. When one NATO member buys Russian SS 400s, when uh, uh, a French uh, frigate tries to uh, check what is in a Turkish ship going to Libya and uh, a Turkish warship catches it on its radar, this is a problem we have to deal with. We cannot just hide our head in the sand. And um, also, as Karim mentioned, uh, I believe that as uh, members of the European Union, for most of us around here, we also have to take the matter of defense and security into our hands, something we have not been able to do uh, personally, I feel extremely optimistic after the, uh, the meeting that took place in, in Brussels between uh, heads of states and governments last week uh, in order to put the EU in a, uh, order a battle for, uh, in order to tackle with the, cons of the economic and social consequences of the virus, but we cannot shun from a resolute security and defense policy for the Union. Whether it uh, functions with NATO, it is supplementary or complementary to NATO, is something to be discussed. Uh, one last point is that the dire straits, to use another marine metaphor that we're in today are also due to the major uncertainty about American policy in the region. What was called, if I remember well, at the last Munich Security Conference, the advent of westlessness, 
sounds awful even to a French ear, um, is something that has changed many items since uh, not only the World War II, but also since, uh, you know, after the demise of the Soviet Union. Um, if the United States consider that they couldn't care less about what happens, or they have minimal interest for what happens in the region, this means that other actors are going to pop in. When I was young, which is way back, we used to say that the most important country of the Mediterranean was the Sixth Fleet. Is it still the case? When Turkish ships start to look for natural gas ashore from the Turkish island of Castellorizon, another NATO member and a EU member, I haven't seen that much of a move except for my compatriots who didn't have much support from the others. And uh, we now see the rise in the Eastern Mediterranean of two regional powers with uh, a very strong feeling for revanche. One being Turkey under Mr. Erdogan's leadership extending close to a century after the treaties that followed World War I and that are considered by the present Turkish leadership as a betrayal of um, the spirit of what was at the time the Ottoman Empire, the Sevres and then Lausanne treaties. We are seeing a sort of feeling that whatever was Ottoman now should become under Turkish influence, whether it be in the northwest or north of Syria, in Iraqi Kurdistan, in Libya, uh, where uh, some 7,000 uh, rebel Syrian fighters have been shipped uh, aboard Turkish ships or plane, while a lesser quantity of pro-Bashar Syrian fighters were shipped by the Russians to Benghazi to fight on the side of uh, Marshal Haftar. And from what we hear, there's a significant discrepancy in the payment because uh, the Turkish mercenaries make $2,000 a month, whereas the Russian mercenaries make only $1,000 a month, so there's still some oil money around. Um, this, is, this is a major problem. Who's gonna police all that? How can we manage? Uh, Russia also has made a very good use for its own sake of the lesser presence of America and of the West. It has used Syria as a means to reconquer superpower status, which it doesn't have for what Russia has become. But nevertheless, Putin used very astutely his limited military means to counterbalance Western influence and used masterfully its diplomacy thanks to a vibrant school of specialists of Islam, of the Arab world and the region in Russia as opposed to the total decay of Arab and Islamic studies in the West underfunded and despised. This is a major challenge for, uh, for all of us. And um, as we are speaking, of course, uh, we are waiting for the uh, November 3 
American presidential election. Everybody in the region is looking at that also. Bibi Netanyahu, Rajiv Tayyip Erdogan, Vladimir Putin would definitely like to see a re-election taking place. Many others are not of this uh, feeling. And um, as of us, for European members of NATO, we hold our breath. But we cannot put the future of our countries. We cannot put the future of our security. We cannot put the future of our defense under the sole aegis of what has become, from my point of view, erratic American policies. We were used to consistent policies. The sort of um, line that was favorable to a lesser American presence in the region, of course, was based over the last three years on the fact that America or the United States of America had become a net oil exporter. And that in 2019, America was the first oil uh, producer with 15 million barrels a day ahead of Russia and Saudi Arabia, which, as you know, led to the fact that Russia decided to boost its production in order to have the price go, prices go down so that the shale oil producers would be ousted from the market. This was a sort of sorcerer's apprentice uh, decision on the part of Putin, but nevertheless, this will mean that America will now have to buy oil again. Hence, the logics that decided that you would not send boots on the American boots on the ground in the region because there was no oil fields to protect at such a cost and at such an electoral cost because, as we all know, President Trump was elected in 2016 thanks to the fact that he won three states, swing over, swinging st swing states, in which so many young people had come back dead from, as they say, their Iraq or uh, Afghanistan. <laughs> is something which is now going, has, will, will now have to be reconsidered because America, for the year to come or the years to come, will not be able to be independent because shale oil prices, shale oil drilling is not competitive anymore. So these are, in a nutshell, a few, um, a few ideas uh, about what we are facing in the region. And um, uh, my role here was to uh, put some uh, salt on our wounds, but this was also for our common good, so that the uh, two uh, panels and round tables on civil society and on geopolitics uh, that will follow will bring us the solutions i've just been asking the, i've just been asking the questions i uh, there again i'm very grateful and that uh, the nato defense college decided to um, tackle those very important issues at this very defining moment. We may be at one of the watershed uh, years in the long period, you know, I would say after World War II and after 1981 and the demise of the Soviet Union. This is, we're at definitely at a defining moment in, in geopolitics, in the future of the Mediterranean, and in the very future of Europe. 
uh, one final word to answer, um, follow up on what Karim uh, we mentioned earlier on. Um, if we think that the sort of massive uh, uh, Chinese supply chain is now an unbearable political challenge, it may be time to rethink the complementarity of the two shores, or the many shores of the Mediterranean. The cost of labor in Morocco is now lower than the cost of labor in China. If instead of sending things being made in China, in, if we could integrate better the Mediterranean with the European Union, think of the capacity of Tunisia, of Morocco, to some extent of Egypt, maybe tomorrow of the Levant after its reconstruction. And after all, this was the path that Turkey had taken when Mr. Erdogan was lauded by everyone uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this may offer a very important option for the future. But in order to deal with that, we have to be firm on security issues. We have to have a NATO and an EU doctrine on that. If we don't, we're in dire straits. Thank you very much. Vi ringrazio molto per aver sentito questo francese parlare in inglese, ma anche questa è una sfida per il futuro. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Claire Spencer. I flew in from London yesterday, and I wish to join all those who've congratulated uh, the NATO Defence College Foundation for having initiated what I think for many of us is the first time we've met in such numbers at an event like this. And for those of us who go to many conferences, boy, we've missed them. So thank you very much again. Um, I also wanted to draw on, well, and thank Professor Capel for posing so many questions which I think this panel has been tasked with addressing. But in passing, when he mentioned the Sixth Fleet, I also was reminded that I grew up in what was then Great Britain, perhaps still is, uh, singing a patriotic song about Britannia rules the waves. Well. That was no longer true even before I was born, and yet somehow the song is still there. So it shows how control over the Mediterranean cannot be taken for granted, that it does change, and some of the received continuities and wisdoms we've had about the region are indeed being challenged in exactly the ways that Professor Capel put forward. So it's up to this panel uh, not only to expand the, the analysis of what's going on, but also to try and come up with some solutions or propositions as to what are the priorities when we look at this region. And interesting, the way it's being organized is that we have two virtual, good afternoon, <laughs> two virtual speakers and two live speakers on the panel. Um, we'll be starting with one of the virtual speakers. Everyone is asked to speak for about seven to ten minutes. Then I'll react with some uh, preliminary discussions or preliminary questions to kick off the discussion. And then you, the, the live audience here, will be allowed to ask questions, but also there will be virtual questions which will be sent in by those uh, who are tuning into this virtually. So. Let's hope it works, because it's real and technology, but for those of us who've been spending the last four months on Zoom conferences, I hope the live aspect of this is a bit of a relief. 
Anyway, our first speaker, the biographies of each speaker can be found in the live leaflets, but also online. Please welcome um, Giovanni Romani, who is head of the Middle East and North Africa section in the Political Affairs and Security Policy Division at NATO HQ. He is joining us from Brussels. So welcome. Please, you have the floor. Good afternoon, and um, I wish I had a more interesting background like the one you have. But thank you for this opportunity, which uh, I will uh, not uh, use to deep dive into the strategic situation in the region, uh, as others will certainly do more eloquently today. Instead, uh, I will focus on the current NATO framework, uh, our ongoing activities, and uh, I will, I will uh, offer some key challenges uh, that we need to address uh, towards an enhanced engagement in uh, Middle East and North Africa. So the region is indeed uh, central to NATO's strategic future, and the alliance is not only focused on the east flank, uh, but has adopted a 360 degrees approach, with this region remaining at the heart of the global security. And one of the three NATO core tasks is actually cooperative security, and NATO and its uh, partners uh, in MENA not only share geographical proximity, but also similar security challenges. And with the increase in instability, this partnership are more valuable than ever. As most of you know, the two primary vehicles of NATO engagement are the Mediterranean dialogue with Israel and six Arab countries, and the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative with four Gulf countries, UAE, Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain. And last year, we actually celebrated the 25th anniversary of the Med Dialogue and the 15th anniversary of the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Let me underline how, despite the tremendous political changes across the region in recent years, which have made the MENA region more fragmented and more unstable, NATO's partnership frameworks have proven to be fairly resilient. Beyond the engagement with individual partners, they also have provided an invaluable forum through which we've been able to discuss, assess, and to some extent also jointly address these common challenges together, often offering an umbrella under which uh, partners could have the diverging position. Let me give you an example of Israel uh, together with the six uh, Arab countries. And, uh, and uh, at the time of the Gulf uh, Cooperation Council crisis, uh, the Gulf countries uh, continued to meet under the NATO umbrella. But what this partnership was into in terms of concrete uh, uh, cooperation? I will. Uh, in the operation areas, uh, I will just this is oh, have we lost the connection? Can anyone indicate whether it's being restored or whether in fact we should come back? <laughs> All right, we'll give it a few minutes to restore the connection and then we'll come back. Ah, ah is it back on? Good. Am I back? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Welcome okay. back. <laughs> so I was talking about the NATO ICI Regional Center in Kuwait, eh, which was created in 2017. Eh? Close to 1,000 participants uh, from all six uh, GCC countries uh, have benefited from the training activities, mostly in 2018, 2019, in the middle of the GCC crisis. Second, we have a hub for the South, which was established in Naples to help enhance uh, align strategic anticipation capacity. And the hub is becoming more and more a key tool to better understand the region and facilitate uh, NATO engagement. Military education and training are the cornerstone of NATO regional policy, and Middle Eastern partners participate in uh, various programs, uh, military exercises, uh, operational courses. Uh, let me mention the NATO school uh, in Germany, and uh, they also the NATO Defense College, uh, which delivers uh, a regional cooperation course, uh, which has trained over 600 officers from NATO and Middle East today. The Alliance and MENA partners also collaborate on counterterrorism, 
in uh, capacity building, but also learning from partners' experience. And uh, as I speak in this very second, uh, there's uh, an ongoing meeting of allies uh, with one of our meta partners on uh, countering terrorism. We also have, as you know, the NATO training mission in Iraq, uh, supporting uh, Iraqi armed forces uh, to uh, prevent the resurgence of ISIS and other terrorist groups. Qatar. Qatar is providing airlift assets coordinated by the NATO Zero Atlantic Disaster Response Coordination Center to support the UN efforts uh, to fight the COVID-19 pandemic and fly medical equipment to three African locations. Mauritania. Over the last few years, NATO has helped Mauritania establish a crisis management center in Nouakchott and four regional operational coordination centers under the NATO Science for Peace and Security Program. New project, Copromedius, uh, has now been launched to improve the coordination between the Mauritanian civil protection and health emergency systems. And this will also have an impact on the broader Sahel region. Jordan, together with the United Nations, NATO has uh, assisted the Jordanian National Center for Security and Crisis Management uh, in achieving full operational capacity. The center was key to monitor and address the Jordan response to the pandemic. These are just a few examples I could uh, expand on many more, but I want now to move uh, to my third and final part, which is looking into the future. So in April this year, the NATO foreign ministers called for an additional NATO engagement in the Middle East and North Africa, focusing on various uh, aspects, including what more NATO can do to fight terrorists, build stability, and strengthen the partnership across the region. This package of additional measures includes uh, lines of efforts uh, such as uh, education and training, interoperability, crisis prevention, public diplomacy, fighting terrorism, and improved coordination with other international organizations. We're working hard to translate this general guidance into concrete uh, measures, uh, but what I want to do now is uh, to offer you the key challenges that we are encountering. So the first, uh, with the exception of Iraq, where, as you know, we have a NATO mission, we are far from having an active direct role in the dramatic crisis that affects the MENA region. Allies have very different positions, and in some cases, uh, these uh, dynamics also affect NATO relations with the MENA partners. So the challenge uh, is uh, to navigate these complexities, uh, to bring added value while preserving the cohesion of the alliance and maintaining fruitful partnerships. Second, how can we intensify our political engagement and cooperation with the countries in the region with an approach that will be agreeable by all allies, uh, avoiding the enemy of the minimum common denominator? Third, we need to improve coherence among the various activities, both from NATO as such and also bilateral. Uh, Bilateral by allies, and engage in the Middle East, of course, and North Africa. Um, we also need to strengthen the coordination with other international organizations. Compared to the EU, the UN, NATO has a much lesser engagement, although it's concentrated on specific areas, uh, defense and security. And the, the lack of a permanent presence, uh, with the notable exception of Kuwait and, of course, Iraq, is sort of a limitation for NATO. So the, the fourth challenge is uh, posed by Russia and China's increased uh, influence, uh, with uh, Moscow playing a key role in some theaters, uh, uh, with security and military issues dominating the, its approach and actions, uh, and of course, uh, economic ambitions uh, determining the Chinese approach uh, to MENA. The fifth uh, challenge is on public diplomacy. At times, uh, uh, we hear about how most regional stakeholders, and to some extent also international organizations, uh, have a distorted and biased image of NATO. And this has an impact on the quality of our interactions. Is it really so? And how can we better communicate the values, the objectives, the activities of the alliance in the region, and to which audiences, because every nation is different from the other. And what we need is a more uh, evidence-based approach, so we're launching two studies to better understand uh, uh, where we need to focus uh, our communication. And my final point, uh, uh, which is the sixth, uh, sixth challenge, uh, is um, uh, I want to underline how our main effort must 
focus on outreach, consultation, teaming up with our partners. We have common security challenges. Most of them affect them much more than they affect the allies. For example, terrorism. We have a lot to learn from their experience and we need to build on what we have done so far, but we need to move towards an even more constructive and to waste street uh, relationships. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for overcoming the technical hitch in the middle. That's admirable. Um, next up is Yosef, who's with us in person, who is Deputy Director of Columbia Global Centers in Tunis. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you to the Foundation for having me here, uh, finally outside of Zoom. Um, and uh, it's, 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 it feels good to see that Rome is um, eternal as ever and very happy to be here. Um, I will talk about the regional dimensions of the Libyan conflict and its effect on, um, on the neighbors, actually. So, um, in the beginning, I'd like to nuance the idea that, um, that Libya became an issue in recent years and after the NATO intervention of 2011. Actually, we should remember that Libya was already a headache for its neighbors during the Gaddafi era due to the mercurial, mercurial nature of uh, Gaddafi and the hegemonic tendencies of the Jamahiri uh, uh, regime. But it's true that the problems um, emanating from Libya today are of different nature and have multiple sources, um, rather than only one source during the Gaddafi uh, time. The first problem, or one of, one of the first problems, uh, is the one related to illegal trade, be it human trafficking, weapons, drugs, and so on, um, which is controlled by criminal organizations whose reach will be hard to dismantle in the future, and um, frankly, they are little addressed internationally. The second issue, which is much more addressed from the international community, is terrorism. Uh, terrorism or radicalism, which is a recurrent threat in North Africa and the Sahel, and uh, Libya offered a fertile ground for uh, the development of terrorist organizations, even though the problem is less acute than feared um, in the past. I mean, compared to the dire predictions we used to give five years ago when uh, ISIS was said to be moving from uh, Syria to Libya, um, it is less dangerous than that, but it is still an issue. And the third uh, big problem with Libya today, after um, illegal trade and uh, terrorism, um, is the fact that Libya today became a global geopolitical arena, um, not unlike Syria actually, obliging Libya's neighbors to rethink their alliances or act according to them. Um, and from what we see today in Libya, the scenario is not uh, leading towards international cooperation at all, um, but rather of maybe some kind of balance of power competition um, if, if, if it works. Um, and today this is, something, this is something that kept emerging year, uh, that kept developing year after year. Um, again, if you look five years ago, solving the Libyan conflict would have required, uh, of course, putting the Libyans together, but um, apart from that would have required putting maybe the Qataris and the Emirates together on the same table and uh, that would have helped to solve the, the conflict. Today, in 2020, there is a metastasis. Uh, there are several layers of conflict uh, in Libya. In addition to the Gulf proxy war that I just mentioned, there is um, some kind of superpower struggle between uh, the US and Russia. There is an intra-NATO uh, dispute between uh, France, Greece, and Turkey. There is an intra-European uh, disagreement between France and Italy. Um, Egypt is fully involved in the conflict. There is also a Turkish-Egyptian uh, tension uh, that is growing, and um, every day we keep hearing new things. So today uh, we've heard that there are preparations on the, um, the Libyan-Egyptian borders. There are also, of course, um, several armed fighters from Libya's uh, neighbors, southern neighbors, such as Sudan and Chad, who are in Libya. Um, so put together, this means that Libya's neighbors need to focus their energy, all their energy, on Libya. Take Egypt, for instance. Um, the country has demographic and economic struggles. The country is, absor is absorbed in a contest with Ethiopia over control of water resources, which are vital for Egypt's uh, survival. Um, 
Egypt is also engaged in, in fighting an ISIS insurgency in the eastern uh, Sinai province. It is also one of the most infected, um, of, of the most affected Arab countries with COVID-19. Yet amid all this, um, Egypt ends up drawn in, uh, into Libya. And uh, in Libya, that's where Cairo sees that um, its, uh, its national security is threatened. Um, also, Egypt is trying to counter Qatar and uh, Turkey in Egypt and to consolidate its ties with uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Take Tunisia also. The country has uh, uh, like 450 kilometers border with Libya, so much less than Egypt or Algeria. Um, but the effects of the Libyan conflict are felt in Tunisia more on the political than on the security um, level. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the, with the Tunisian politics, but uh, there is yet another political crisis uh, in Tunisia. The government just resigned. Um, there will be hopefully soon a new government. It will be actually the 10th government in 10 years, a little bit like what happens in Italy, but actually in, in a more accelerated uh, rate. Um, of course, there are several internal dynamics that led to this issue, to this uh, situation in Tunisia. Um, even though actually the, the government dealt very well with COVID-19, Tunisia today is almost COVID-free. But um, if you follow the development of the current crisis, of the current political crisis in Tunisia, um, you can start it, the starting point would be the visit of um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in December 2019. By then, he reportedly asked the, um, for an authorization to use Tunisian land and airspace um, for the Libya campaign. The Tunisian president refused, uh, but the leaders of the Islamist-inspired uh, the Nahda party, um, who are considered close to Ankara, attempted to intercede or to mediate uh, with, with the Tunisian president, and um, they failed. And actually that triggered um, um, a deeper crisis between, um, between um, the, the president and uh, Nahda and led to, to, um, uh, to the current uh, situation. So the, uh, there are several events that happened in the country since then, including tumultuous parliamentary and media debates uh, about the Turkish role in, in Libya. And th these, um, so this issue actually deepened the political polar polarization that, um, that is taking place in the country. And um, it is actually a reminder, now the situation in Tunisia in terms of polarization is um, somewhat reminiscent of the 2013 uh, crisis. Algeria uh, is also worried about the situation in Libya, uh, both for security reasons uh, and for geopolitical ones. Um, Sudan is also impacted by the conflict in Libya. Uh, there are mercenaries from Sudan in Libya, up to 3,000 uh, mercenaries, according to, to a number of sources. Um, some of them are actually uh, fighting for, most of them are actually fighting for the LNA for, um, uh, in, in Libya. And um, there was an interview of the Guardian, the Guardian interviewed a number of them, I think in January, um, and um, they said that some of these fighters say that their ultimate goal is to go back to Sudan and fight against the authorities there. So a little bit um, like what happened in Mali in uh, 2012. Um, and of course the Sahel is uh, deeply uh, and directly in, impacted by the situation in Libya. Uh, in January, the Secretary General of the UN said that uh, the situation in Libya will impact the Sahel and Lake Chad countries as far as the Ivory Coast and uh, Ghana. And this is not an exaggeration. Um, again, we all remember the putsch of 2012 in Mali, um, which was linked to the transfer of arms and uh, fighters from Libya. And Mali, it should be reminded, uh, doesn't share borders with Libya. Um, also, uh, most recently, last year, uh, there was um, a, convo a convoy of fighters uh, from Libya that was heading, head heading to Chad um, that was uh, bombed, um, according to most reports, by uh, French jets. So this convoy um, belongs to a rebel organization that is a Chadian rebel organization that is based in Libya. Um, so as you see, the countries in the region are directly impacted by, um, uh, by, uh, by the situation in Libya. Um, and I will now conclude with um, a few recommendations. Um, and I think 
one, the first one would be that the, the immediate neighbors of Libya, the leaders of the immediate neighbors of Libya need to sit together. Um, so far, Algeria and Egypt do occasionally host high-level discussions with officials from Tunisia, Chad, Niger, and so on um, to advance security cooperation, but um, their, effor their efforts remain limited in ambitions. Um, and the multiple alliances of the two of these countries um, make cooperation so far difficult or at least limited. The second recommendation may be, uh, as I said, there is this uh, geopolitical rivalry between uh, NATO member states, France, Greece and Turkey. Um, and it's surprising that so far there was no specific NATO meeting uh, to, to tackle this issue, while I think it's, it's a priority. Um, and the third one, um, I think if the EU, if the Uni European Union wants to be taken seriously in Libya, on Libya, um, it has to confront all sides um, and show more impartiality. Uh, operation Irini, for instance, um, is mainly an anti-Turkish operation that fits Emirati, Egyptian, uh, French, uh, foreign policy interests, but um, so that it targets one side and it doesn't target another side while all these uh, sides are playing directly in Libya. And um, in 30 seconds, I say thank you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Yosef, and I'm sure we'll be back later to test some of those recommendations and see whether we can actually progress them. And it's also, a reminder to those of you watching this virtually that you're encouraged also uh, to post your questions for that session coming up. But now we'll move on to our second virtual speaker, Yunus Abayoub, who's joining us. Welcome, Ahlan, from New York, who is the director of the Governance and State Building Division for the MENA region at the United Nations New York. So please, Yunus, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor uh, to discuss such a, a complex issue. I'll try to do my best in uh, between seven and ten minutes. Um, the, the conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa have been multiplying, as we all know, and in increasingly intersecting, which comple complicates actually and delays more and more the efforts to resolve them. So the big question, can the region recover from what's been going on for at least a decade now? And if so, what shape will this region uh, look like in the future? Uh, national identities, which were subsumed by a series of com competing subnational identities, are more and more shaken uh, in these uncertain times. Uh, we see, for instance, that there are some forms of uh, local governance that are appearing, uh, where the state has dissolved and uh, uh, little by little uh, receding. We can see this in Yemen, we see it in Libya, we've seen it in Syria, Iraq. Uh, and some of them constitute experiments that might prevent a return of the fierce authoritarian state in the region, or maybe even the state uh, to court. Uh, some obstacles to attempts by societies also to reconstruct the social fabric that have been severely damaged during these years is also appearing. Um, these current conflicts uh, have become a more and more intersecting uh, now. They started at the national level, but now it's no longer a national issue. Uh, there's another element that is trans-regional, uh, and which is more and more the increasing uh, regional and international geopolitical com competition that is taking the form of uh, direct external interventions, while at the beginning they were not uh, so direct and so obvious. Uh, that will do even greater harm uh, by militarizing solutions to what is intrinsically uh, a political problem, uh, and of course that emanates originally from socioeconomic challenges and development failures in all these uh, countries of the region. This will further polarize already divided polities and undermine either local efforts or uh, national efforts to reestablish or renegotiate social contracts to rebuild these uh, polities. So we should all actually gain a more nuanced understanding of the current crisis that is exacerbated even further now with uh, the pandemic. And we should look into more uh, policy design that at least do no harm, if not contribute to a more stable future for the region. 
the since 2011 at least the arab uh, world has been undergoing a series of uh, development systemic shock 2011 has been uh, a major one uh, but the region is also facing uh, a lot of different challenges the turmoil which took place uh, in 2011 uh, which became as i said earlier as a domestic or national issue has since developed to far more complex regional ramifications and, and more and more global. Since then, the domestic focus of concern has moved from the issues of socioeconomic and development challenges to a more of a security issue, which is rapidly imploding across the region. Uh, the domestic politics have therefore moved from what is supposed to be a reform uh, at the governance level, socioeconomic uh, level, to a more security agenda, which is dangerously ignoring the fact that socioeconomic issues were the driving factors of all this at the beginning. Uh, so we, in a way, the region finds itself in, in the conundrum of the chicken and egg the dilemma. So while security forces are overstretched everywhere, defense budgets are rising across the region, and the security vacuums which have opened up in the wake of the events of 2011 uh, in most of these countries uh, have expanded and illicit network uh, at the regional level present uh, there have grown into full-scale non-state and terrorist organizations. Sometimes these organizations cooperate between themselves, sometimes not, sometimes they compete, but uh, they are expanding more and more as the, the uh, former speakers um, said, for instance, in the Libyan conflict towards the Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there have been an alarming rise of terrorism across the region, uh, often combated by armed forces rather by uh, uh, internal security services or preemptive action. This will reinforce, uh, which is a trend we already see now, the political role of the military. Uh, while we see new terrorism laws conflates political opposition with terrorist activities. So security re sector reform, uh, which should have been the focus from the beginning, is now even further postponed uh, virtually everywhere. So this is uh, uh, another transregional challenge which basically puts the region in a vicious circle that threatens the region with more protracted and complex conflict. Uh, the socioeconomic level. The region remains uh, challenged in economic terms. Uh, Arab GDP that was already in a decade ago, uh, very low compared to the world average. Uh, a lot of disparities and inequalities across the region uh, have increased. So we clearly face serious difficulties in terms of wealth creation and distribution, which are the origin of this issue. With the proliferation now of conflicts in the region, parallel economic systems have established themselves, and they will fuel even more ongoing cycle of violence. Uh, Yemen and Syria have evolved clearly from a, a states that were beset by economic problems and socio, so, so social issues to full-blown war economies. Uh, in terms of the Human Development Index, for instance, today Syria is back where it was almost uh, four decades ago. And even at a very optimistic growth rate, uh, it will take at least 30 or 40 years for Syria to return, if ever, to its uh, GDP values before uh, a decade ago. The issue, of, of course, of the pandemic just exacerbates the problem that already existed. But Syria is only an example among several other economies, uh, Libya, Yemen, Iraq, uh, and, and over the, the region, even those countries that have not imploded uh, uh, so far. The struggling economies of the region are the outcome of several uh, different developments. It's not only the conflict. The conflicts have exacerbated what had what already existed. I mean, issues of weak institutions, corruption, delayed reforms, uh, low foreign direct investment, uh, lack of resources for some countries, especially the LDCs. Um, all these have called for urgent reforms to address the deteriorating security and business environment. But unfortunately, uh, this uh, has not been uh, uh, addressed uh, timely and the COVID-19 pandemic plus the ramifications of the conflict are just making things even more complex for, for the years to come. Uh, I heard uh, reference this morning to the Sykes-Picot uh, agreement in SEV, and um, it's a big question about Sykes-Picot states. I mean, uh, all Arab states today struggle with national identity. Uh, this is 
been highlighted by the ongoing debate on the disappearance of the size keeper state uh, as the main political ideologies are now more and more regional than national and implicitly seek the abolition of the Arab state as such. Uh, Mr. Capel talked about the Ottomanization of foreign policy of Turkey, for instance. We have um, Iran uh, looking at its own revenge uh, in the region. The different, different forms of Islamism uh, reject the regional state system as it is, and as we have known it uh, for almost a century now, and they seek to establish a large uh, um, different type of, uh, of organization and polity. Um, again, one of the, uh, the challenges that, the challenge that these conflicts uh, have created at the regional level is the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. Although the Arab region has been militarized to a significant extent since the end of the World War II, the last decade particularly has seen an increase in arms proliferation. So broadly speaking, there are uh, three dimensions to this, the diversion and stock of stockpile leakages in the post-conflict setting. I mean, Libya uh, and, and Iraq, for instance, uh, even Yemen, the transfer of arms to non-state actors and the ongoing military buildups by states that are afraid of the spillover of these conflicts on their national security. Um, conflicts, of course, are the main culprit in this regard. They create conditions for either government releasing weapons into the population or looting of stockpiles, for instance. This is a clear case of, of Libya. Uh, the invasion of Iraq led to the transfer of at least uh, 4 million, if not more, uh, uh, of small arms and light weapons to non-state actors or the wider civilian population, some of which ended up being used in the insurgency and the rise of the, the terrorist group Islamic State. In Libya, uh, more than 15 million weapons have ended up not only in the hands of the population, but spread into as many as 14 countries in, in, in the region, uh, or rather the sub-region. Uh, the proliferation of weapons of course, it's always a worsening trend, especially in the region that is very unstable. Uh, in, in this case, they do facilitate the onset of violence and stability. Uh, there are ways, of course, of mitigating this, but unfortunately, at the, the early stage of these uh, uh, revolution or, or uh, rebellions or transitions, we call them uh, different names because we, there's no real agreement on what happened. For instance, Libya, uh, there was no real national dialogue at the beginning or no uh, particular sector reform or DDR uh, at the beginning. So what, what happened in Libya is a, a com complete shift of priorities that, that were wrong. Instead of going for the establishment of the foundation of the new state, uh, things went directly towards uh, power sharing uh, modalities that are actually uh, undermined uh, the, any process of state construction on, on which on one of the main bases should have been uh, uh, DDR. The second also oh, security sorry. trend. Your time is pretty much oh. up, but I hope this is your concluding. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank so you. I wanted to talk about the rise of, of uh, extremism and organized crime, which are more and more linked in the region. Uh, but you can leave this to the uh, yeah, question and answer. But in sum, what, yeah. what I want to say is that the picture is yeah. far from rosy. Uh, yes. Of course, Arab states are, <laughs> set, I mean, looking at many years of, of more complex complications. Uh, and, and I mean, but at the same time, these challenges also, in my opinion, present the region with opportunities. Uh, they, okay. There is need for serious uh, rethinking of uh, policies that have led the, the region to what it is today. Um, okay. Well, thank you. We'll come back to you one, for the one, one, one more. Okay. In dealing with these. <laughs> With this, uh, the conflict resolution of these conflicts, one thing that the international community keeps missing is that we look at them in the silo mentality. We look at Libya alone, we look at Syria alone, we look at Iraq. Well, these have become way more trans regional. So any attempt at resolving them should, from now on, look at them from a regional and more increasingly a global perspective. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll come back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Right, finally, last but certainly not least, uh, Mitchell Belfer, President of the Eurogulf Information Centre, will be our last contributor. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for having me today. Uh, I woke up this morning to um, being in the middle of the Cold War uh, that's happening in the Middle East. Um, and so I'm dealing with, I'm a little bit uh, shaken by all that. But nonetheless, I like to start my presentations always with a joke, um, because you'll see how, how the relevance is. So a man walks into a doctor's office and he, he says, doctor, doctor, you have to help me. My, my brother, he, he thinks he's a chicken. And the man, the doctor looks at him and says, well, that's ridiculous. Just go tell him he's not a chicken. He, I, can't, I can't do it, doctor, because I need the eggs. And, and unfortunately, across the Middle East, since the end, and, and this is where I, I really begin our chapter, since the end of World War I, you have a lot of state building that's been going on and a lot of the different groups and the different countries that are engaged in state building are simultaneously looking inwards, but they're also looking outwards at what they believe are their eggs. And so from what I would like, I mean, I'm a bit of an optimist, I have to say it. I'm, uh, I'm a Middle Eastern optimist in the sense that I believe that today will be better than tomorrow. Um, however, you see, it's that little trick, that little play on words. Um, however, it's, it's, I think, very important um, to keep a bit of optimism. And I say that from the perspective of being here in Europe and, of course, being hosted by the NATO Defense College Foundation, NATO Defense College uh, as well, and the Center for, for the uh, South and stu uh, the South Studies. Um, I think that it's, it's very important for us to remember a little bit of where we came from and what the conditions were in Europe a hundred years ago as we went through these tremendous conflicts. By the way, after World War I, we should be remembered that people were walking around with masks just the same. Uh, we had a, a terrible pandemic that paralyzed our European and international economies. And they say the rest is history, but history lives in motion. And I think it's important that uh, I, I know that uh, one of the speakers earlier today reminded us of the, um, of the return to a mosque of Hagia Sophia uh, and the way that the imam walked up the, the pulpit carrying a sword from 100 years ago from the Ottoman Empire. It's easy for us to now look backwards and say we can reconcile ourselves with history, but not everybody can. And I think that what we're experiencing now is not renewed conflict. It's a, re, it's, it's a continuous conflict. The only differences, the major differences in the area that I would like to focus the majority of my talk on is the, um, the way that power has been distributed, the way that alliances have been formed, and also the way that anarchy is interacting with these two. So in other words, we actually have to go back to international relations theory traditional international relations theory, the same theories that were developed when we were going through the Cold War in Europe and globally, of course. And we have to try to make sense using the same parameters that we had walked through all those decades ago. We have to try to make sense of what is occurring now in, um, in, in, in the Middle East. So very quickly, when we talk about power, there's such a gross power imbalance that we experience in the Middle East. There had been a time, we can call it, you know, Pax Americana or the American moment, um, which essentially, you know, was between the end of the Soviet Union and carried us right through until September 11th. But after September 11th, America's gut reaction has been both hot and cold when it came to the region. So, of course, jumping into Iraq with all the consequences that we know that happened there, uh, but also um, talking at times of pivoting out of the Middle East. So it sends all these mixed messages, but what it's producing is a kind of vacuum on top, and that vacuum on top is not being exploited necessarily by the international actors, but rather they're being exploited by the local actors as these actors come to terms with where their power ends and their neighbor's power begins. And so I think it is very important for us to see also and try to anticipate what kind of uh, region we're heading to. Are we heading into a region of parity and balance of power? Are we heading into a region of hegemony um, or preponderance of power? Because in, in either case, 
um, the international community is going to have to adjust itself to how the outcome of this long-term struggle uh, looks like. The, the second part that, of course, when you have this power struggle on the highest level, the second part to think about is anarchy. And what we're facing in the world today and what we're facing in the region today, because you don't have an agreement on the balance of power, you're having increased anarchy and that anarchy, again, is going to reinforce the vacuums. And most importantly, it's been eroding the, the, the institutions that had been slowly but steadily building in the region to create mechanisms of dialogue and communication between the various actors. Now we can say, I think, uh, quite clearly, a, a, you know, an institution like the League of Nations, uh, like the League of Arab States, like the League of Nations as well, of course, but like the League of Arab States, has become more of a talk shop instead of fulfilling what its original mandate had been, which was to essentially consolidate uh, policy behaviors amongst the Arab countries. Um, we have not seen major institutionalization since. The only, the only true uh, exception to this is the Gulf Cooperation Council. Uh, and in the GCC, um, of course, we know that there's the intra-GCC uh, crisis that continues you know, to, to hamper uh, deepening of that institution. But at its very core and its very reasoning, the GCC is an important uh, organization which not only provides uh, communications, uh, but it also provides security, uh, and it had intended to provide a common economic space so that all the countries could benefit. That's as close as we've come to filling and to, 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 uh, to preventing, the, let's say, the complete anarchy from gripping the region. So there, there's scope for, for institutionalization there as well. And finally, in relation to alliances, we've seen tremendous shifts over the past decade or so in the way that alliances have been configured in the region. For example, 10, 12 years ago, we would have, maybe a little longer ago, no, 10 years ago, um, we would have been rather referring to the Israel, Turkey, um, Egypt, Jordan, maybe not alliance, but at least grouping. Israel and Turkey had been cooperating and collaborating on almost every security-related issue. Now we're talking about in Israel, Greece, Cyprus, and then you have, of course, Egypt continues to play a role with Israel, but now you're also referring to an Egypt, Saudi Arabia, a Jordan Gulf Cooperation Council, even a Morocco Gulf Cooperation Council alignment, which has been steadily and uh, consistently brewing. So, oh, I'm, I'm totally over time. Um, I'm sorry, the, the, the minutes no. have just vanished. Um, no, no, you still have two minutes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's when it's red, it means you're all in danger zone. Okay. I'm, in the, I'm in the danger zone. Sorry, I, I, I saw the green to red and I, I oh, just no, panicked. No, no. It'll start flashing. When you're <laughs> so, again, what we see is these major shifts in alliances. We see uh, anarchy and we see uh, that there's these power voids on the top in these vacuums. So, it's, it's very easy, of course, we have to look at all three of the main levels. We have to look at the individuals. We have to look at, you know, now, now there's difference um, of communication because technologies have changed. But the core issues that are unfolding in the Middle East today are the very same that were left over from the First World War. So if we want to keep dealing with the symptoms of problems, fair enough. But actually, if we want to deal and create proper solutions, we have to go to the root causes of what these problems are. The way that decolonization took place. Which groups were empowered and which groups were not empowered. Which, which territories have been, you know, uh, for example, artificially divided and how do we reconcile that? So mechanisms need to be built and put in place not to deal with the last three years, but to deal with the last century of turmoil in the region. It's made especially clear now because of the removal of the Cold War system and the temporary United States total hegemony in the region that's been reduced in part by its own internal uh, situation, uh, but also in part because of a changing world. So I, I often remark that we don't have a crystal ball. We do have a crystal ball. The future of the Middle East is the future of Europe or the present of Europe. The same processes that led to a united Europe are also at play in the Middle East today. 
we're not just talking about a blanket rejection, for example, of a European Union. Of course, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I'm not, you know, in my head in the clouds. Um, I don't think that tomorrow we're going to wake up and we're going to be in a, um, a European Union as such of, of the Middle East. But I do think that the same mechanisms that were at play, the great power struggles, the dynamics on the social level, the changing economies, youth empowerment, all these things are going to create a bit more levity in the future generations of international politics of the Middle East. And I leave you on that note that in fact we do have a crystal ball and if we, if we steer the course, we could end up on the other side with something that is prosperous and that is contributing to global affairs and not just to the nation states that compose the Middle East. Right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. Now we have the difficult task of encapsulating all the questions. I've already seen one from the floor. Um, including the virtual ones in about a quarter of an hour. So I've been asked to start the ball rolling. I think I'll make my question or reflections generic, which is I think all of you have spoken of fragmentation and inherently explicitly or less explicitly the lack of leadership. And I know following on from what you've said, Mitchell, uh, there's an increasing debate out there about the future of the state as constructed on existing models and the return of empires. And when we talk of the return of the empires, we're thinking of the Turkish Empire. So we've already had previously mention of the Ottoman Empire. The Russians are in the business of building an empire. Um, what does that mean for the Middle East? And what are, I suppose the main question I would ask is where you're looking at things from, where you're working from, and this is a question for all of you, whether at the UN, whether in NATO HQ, what significant form of leadership would make a difference? Where do you wish to see leadership coming from? Because it could be, as I think Eunice, you've hinted at, bottom up. We need to pay more attention to socioeconomic changes. If you look at uh, historical theories, indeed practice of uh, disruptive change, it's very rarely does the new normal come, sorry to use that phrase, what the new dispensation comes from on top. It's actually this fragmentation of existing institutions that leads the way and offers the opportunity for something completely different to come, like a black swan from somewhere completely different. So this could be, for example, an area I'm interested in, the younger generations of the region, um, which Karim spoke so strongly about earlier, actually doing something very disruptive because they are the digital natives. They can do things virtually that the older generations can't do. But that presupposes a semblance of uh, an infrastructure for them to do that, uh, security, stability enough, for a new type of economics to emerge. So that's just one example. So my question to all of you very briefly, if you can give me a very short response, what type of new leadership do you think would make a difference to where you're sitting? Uh, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Romani. Can you hear me? Giovanni, the question is to you. And you had a specific challenge to say how you're going to resolve into intra-NATO problems, but you might leave that to one side. But what kind of leadership do you think we need to see? You, if you're talking about the leadership we need to see in the Middle East, uh, I would say yeah. a leadership that aggregates, uh, that looks at multilateralism, that uh, looks into areas that unite, uh, that leverages uh, membership uh, in international organizations. So, so uh, that uh, goes towards original stability. That's the leadership we'd like to see. Let me offer another uh, uh, consideration, which is my personal opinion, but it's not going to be a NATO position, of course. When, uh, uh, since I, I engage, of course, on a daily basis with, uh, with these uh, ambassadors, particularly these countries, the, um, you talk about leadership, uh, the, uh, for example, the countries of the Gulf, uh, they come from uh, a certain uh, level of stability, if you think about it, because they have uh, ruling families that have ensured uh, 
uh, like a certain continuity. And actually, those countries that have been lucky have also had regional leaders that uh, were able to project the country into the long term. And, um, and so this kind of uh, long-term perspective looks for a partnership, which is also long-term. And that is where I would argue that uh, countries such as Russia and China have uh, a certain advantage because uh, those interlocutors are actually uh, interlocutors which are stable. And uh, it's not always the same when the Middle Eastern, uh, let's say, most stable countries got its government. Uh, engage uh, with the Western world in which we have uh, governments that can change uh, like from one year to the other and uh, not always maintain a certain uh, continuity of policy. So that is where I would say we have to look at leadership in the Middle East or we have to look at leadership also in the West. Okay, Dr. Rani, while I'm here, we have a question, a virtual one from Zoom, which is, do you have any perspective for inclusive NATO, ICI and NATO Mediterranean dialogue? in mind? Where is the overlap between these two? And is, are there plans to make one? There are no current plans to make one. They are uh, different uh, geographically and uh, also in terms of uh, content. Med Dialogue is a much longer partnership program which went more uh, like into the depth of cooperation with a number of countries uh, and uh, the ICI is a younger and I would say still in development. The advantage we have in ICI is that now we were able to establish uh, a center in Kuwait which I hope will, uh, will bring forward this, uh, this cooperation program but I would say it still uh, hasn't catched up with the uh, dialogue yet. And uh, I do not see how they can merge uh, and um, they, they, they're very different, and uh, so I, I don't see any perspective on merging. But certainly I see a, a lot of uh, a promising kind of uh, avenues for the, uh, the evolution of that. Thank you. Back to Yusuf for the original leadership question. So I think what is needed are leaders that represent their own population, that are accountable for their own population. Otherwise, we'll keep having these dictators who are, one, very brutal, um, two, who would see national security or their, their people's security from a very um, narrow point of view that actually respond to the people who are around them, who are their uh, core, um, and who would be more accountable to their uh, foreign masters, be it the Europeans, the Turks, the Americans, rather than their own population. But you would tell me, well, uh, representative uh, leaders, we've had that in 2011 in, in some Arab countries, um, and they didn't it didn't work that well. It's true. And here comes the point of um, empowering, empowering youth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, I mean, from a utopian or, or a realist perspective, both of them, that's the most important thing. We need to empower youth in uh, the region. Um, and a few countries are doing that, but most, frankly, most Arab countries today are in <laughs> uh, but most, most <laughs> Arab countries today are empower, empowering co-opted youth. So actually they are empowering um, the youth that um, belong to their circles or the, who are completely um, vassal, vassalized, if, if I can use the, the term, um, to, their, um, to, to their own. And so they don't see the other alternative, they don't see the um, other point of view. Um, and therefore, we're not really empowering youth in the Arab world, while that's the most important thing that should happen. Well, can I assure you, I have it on good authority that the non-co-opted youth of the region are busy empowering themselves, and they're doing it below the radar, because the whole point is they don't want to be co-opted. Whether they succeed or not, we won't know until they succeed. So it's one of those conundrums that historical change usually takes place out of sight, gathers momentum, gathers speed, and then emerges uh, to the surprise of those who didn't see it coming. But that's intentional. So let's hope that works. Um, Eunice, it's your turn. What kind of leadership would you like to see? Uh, it's, it's, interesting it's interesting that, that um, uh, we, I mean, I'm, I use the we as a global we, have not learned lessons from the past. And in 2011, when you had um, uh, these movement that were initiated in Tunisia and other places uh, where you could have uh, empowered local voices so that people of the region uh, could 
determine their future and build their policies the way they see fit, they were not given uh, that chance, unfortunately, because of the way the world uh, functions. It's interesting to see, for instance, that Tunisia, where uh, there was no intervention at the beginning, uh, they, they succeeded uh, to a certain extent and avoided violence. It is also interesting to see Yemen in 2015 with the first and only national dialogue uh, uh, conference that managed to uh, avoid uh, uh, the, the uh, violence in Yemen. I mean, Yemen is an interesting example because it's one of the, the countries in the Arab region which has a huge amount of, of, uh, of weapons, small arms and individual weapons. They were not used in 2011 mm. until the agreement and the national dialogue outcomes were basically stifled by uh, the military uh, intervention in 2015. These are two interesting cases about uh, leadership and the fact that the new leaderships were not allowed to uh, emerge have made these frustrations even more serious and uh, go into to more conflict. The regarding leadership that exists today and in connecting it with your question about uh, the return of the empire and the recent receding national states, it is also interesting to note that there's only two major uh, projects of empire in the region so far, which is the Iranian one and the Turkish one. There's no Arab project, unfortunately. No. And so far, all the Arab uh, movements have been just reactions to what's been happening. And it's increasingly the case that the future looks more uh, a divide, not on national identities, but mostly because of the, uh, the new uh, discourse uh, between leaders of the Sunnis and leaders of the Shia, which is clear in the competition between uh, in the region between uh, Turkey and Iran. Thank you. So is the implication that the Arabs will become victims of somebody else's successful empire? I'm perhaps reading too much into your comments. There. No, it's true, it's true. It's already the case. Yeah. It's not the it's already, it's already happening. happening. Yes, they already have been. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Mitchell, you were the one who raised anarchy and hegemony. So what kind of leadership would you like to see and that's how do we get it? Well, f first, I'd like, uh, perhaps it's important to look at it as a process. Yeah. Um, leadership has always been a process, uh, no matter where you are in the world. So there's no silver bullet to what kind of leadership in which particular country. What I think would be more apt is we can refer to it perhaps as maturing sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, sovereignty is a very tricky situation, a uh, very tricky concept. And if Europe and the European experience has taught us anything, is that countries that are secure, in their sovereignty, then try to get rid of their sovereignty and pool together sovereignty, as we've seen both in NATO in the security field, but also in the European Union on all levels. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the requisite re reactionary uh, behavior, for example, like Britain's uh, withdrawal and Brexit. Um, but nonetheless, I think that there are lessons to be learned about how to respect each other's sovereignty, no matter what leadership or ideology the countries have. Because Personally, if Iraq is a blossoming democracy or if it's a, you know, a Marxist dictatorship, it should, that's the answer to its people or its people will answer that issue. It should not be a regional issue because of the kind of regime that Iraq has. But because countries are running after their so-called eggs, they allow their ideology to play a role in how they see their neighbors. So I think what we have to do is come up with a, a, a an, like a, a red line on sovereignty so that when the countries can feel um, secure enough in their borders, um, then they can start talking about getting rid of this um, kind of competition, getting rid of the, the sovereign walls that separate them. I think you would have friends in Beijing for saying that. I think it's a very <laughs> Chinese reflection. Right, I'm opening now to the floor. I've seen one hand, oh, one hand already. It's time to get the glasses on. So <laughs> shall I start at this side? It's not very democratic. I'll start at this side of the room and move across. Um, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, Fabio, Rear Admiral Fabio Agostini. I'm uh, Operation Commander, Operation uh, Irini. Um, uh, it's not my habit to, to argue with uh, such uh, a qualified uh, uh, panel, but I think I cannot leave this audience uh, with a wrong message that I heard just from uh, Mr. Sharif. Uh, I would like to underline 
that uh, the statement that Iran is against Turkey is completely wrong. And uh, let's say that we can start uh, in uh, mentioning the, uh, the council decision that launched the operation, the statement of Mr. Borrell, of course, even the results that we have achieved so far that are both, both uh, in the side of uh, the two parts. We are, we are not against anybody. We are not against uh, Turkey. We are not against Russia. We are against uh, uh, the traffic, the, the illicit traffic in uh, in uh, uh, in Libya, whatever they are, uh, weapons, uh, oil smugglers, and, and uh, human trafficking. So uh, I would like to underline that uh, your statement is wrong. But if you like, we can uh, argue a little bit more uh, during the coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that clarification. Right, who's next? A familiar face, I think you'll find, <laughs> when he takes his mask off. Most kind. I wanted to ask a, a question to, to, to Mitchell, probably, who is freer to answer. Uh, uh, you know, minimum common denominator, well, at least, you know, for NATO countries, it should be Russia. Uh, what do you think about? Thank you. Have you got a quick, quick response to that, and then I'll ask the next person to go up? Yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. No, no, you answer while okay. the other person. It's logistics. Sorry, yes. Getting so to the absolutely. I mean, there's there, especially for NATO's foundation, uh, the Soviet Union had been the common denominator to to bring them together. In the Middle East, I think it's too diverse. Um, some countries, especially those that are proximate to Israel, have felt that Israel um, is going to be the greater threat. Those that are further away, especially after the revolution in Iran 1979, um, they've, they've felt more of the acuteness of Iranian presence. And now you have also uh, Turkey for some time. So I, I think that you don't have this common denominator. Um, although it, it, there could be, I mean, we like to paint things in broad strokes, um, but I, I just, I don't see that. So I think we have to create one. And in creating one, it doesn't have to be the demonization of somebody else. But I think that there are, for example, the future. And you can get, rally around the kind of future that you want for your region and for your people. But, you know, I, I think you're right um, in the security, on, on a security level. But um, anything short of that, I, I think that at this point, at least even in security affairs, you do not have that kind of agreement. Okay, next question. Yes, my question is, uh, what should be the relationship between NATO and EU? In particular today, as the Admiral says, there are misunderstandings on these important uh, operations of Irini. And uh, obviously there is no exit strategy like in the European Union in NATO. So Turkey is an ally and uh, how, uh, according to you both, because uh, Mr. Mitchell said about the integration, also processes that are happening in Mediterranean and MENA region. I'm not talking about Arab world, as Karim said correctly this morning. So what should be the relationship uh, between these two international organizations that are fundamental for the stabilization of the area? Thank you. Is that addressed to the whole panel, or to well, two people uh, in Mr. particular? Mr. Uh, uh, Mitchell and also, um, I forgot. The Yusuf. Yes, Yusuf, thanks. Okay, right. Very quick responses, and I'll just check one last question, otherwise we're going to have to draw the line. Right, there's a gentleman at the back, so if you'd like to go to the mic, ready. Quick response, please. It, yeah, I mean, just um, sorry for being provocative regarding the, um, the Irini uh, question, but my point was um, that uh, weapons coming to Libya come by land, sea, and air. Um, so by land, they come easily from Egypt and from the south, by air, they come from Turkey, but also from um, the UAE. Um, but by sea, it's mainly Turkey. So yes, it's not meant to be an anti-Turkish operation, but it happens to be like that. Um, and uh, with regard to the second question, um, I mean, from between EU and NATO, I think there is a lot of um, a lot of uh, common uh, common agreements, um, common uh, principles. Um, so it's um, from someone from outside. It's always surprising to see um, so much disagreements happening um, among among these different countries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would I would I would very quickly add that the I think the the best thing that NATO and the EU can do to uh, Gulf and to Middle Eastern in general uh, institutions 
is lessons learned. We have to know that it wasn't an easy process. We have to know that France left NATO's military uh, uh, planning for, for what, three decades, four decades? Um, that Greece and Turkey, NATO members, sometimes fight each other. That the road to building a institu an institution that functions is not easy, but it's a road worth taking. And if you, of course, now when you look at the state of, of Europe and the distrust that we all have now um, towards European institutions, of course, we say, oh, but was it worth it in the end? But yes, it was worth it all in the end. And so I think that's the only real thing to do is to impart those lessons learned, to reassure uh, <coughs> our, our uh, allies and friends in the Middle East that, that this is a process and that because we live in this very interactive uh, uh, world, um, that we have these expectations that come very, very quickly, we have to provide a realistic assessment of how those, how those goals can be achieved um, without it being so transactional uh, okay. over a longer time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, so I've noticed we've got two further questions, so if you could keep them very brief, we are now eating into coffee time. Thank you, time. thank you. I have uh, two, two very brief questions. One is uh, uh, related uh, uh, to the rule of Turkey. Uh, we have reports about increasing uh, involvement of Turkey in Yemen. Uh, we have been told of uh, what is happening in Eastern Mediterranean. So the question is how all these uh, uh, can affect uh, the role of NATO uh, in the region uh, through the exercises that NATO has with the region. The second question is about uh, China, which has not been mentioned in, uh, uh, in the panel up to now. So how do you see the role of uh, China at the moment uh, in, the, uh, in the region? Thank you. Well, I think the role of China is another whole lecture, but I assume that's addressed to the whole panel? Yes. Okay, I'll ask you to hold that. Please stand forward for your question. Good afternoon, my name is Shaina Modares from Luis Guido Carli. My question is addressed to Mr. Belfer. I really appreciate your optimism about what you said, but one thing that you should consider is once we get over the Islamic radicalization in the whole zone, there is something else that what you mentioned, the sovereignty, is a certain sense of nationalism that is growing in all these countries, not only in the Middle East, but also in the MENA region, and as an example, you can see there are many people who are not Islamists but are actually supporting the Erdogan decision regarding the Santa Sofia or Hagia Sofia. Mm -hmm. You can see that considering this, do you think the cooperation and the union that you have in mind for future can be achievable? Thank you. Okay, I'll remind everyone we're talking about civil societies later on this afternoon, so we can actually tackle some of that. But Mitchell, you can you can respond. The first questions, though, um, Giovanni, do you have any response to that, or are you still with us? No, I think he's gone. So, no time at all for any responses. D Yosef, you've got two seconds, but two seconds on Turkey. Um, I yeah. think Turkey is tried, I uh, would tried a few times to bring NATO in, and um, we've seen it recently in Libya, um, when Russia started um, putting um, pl planes and adding more weapons in, in Libya, um, Turkey was playing on the NATO card, but most of the time NATO is being a rogue, NATO, uh, Turkey is being a rogue NATO country, um, and it's also surprising that um, there are no, um, you know, no measures at all taken um, to calm Turkey down. Right, thank you very much. Would you say the same? Yeah, so, so I, I would, I'll be very, very, very quick very just to answer. Um, I would think that Islamic, so-called Islamic radicalism and nationalism are actually two sides of the same coin. Um, and what it is, it's, it's, it's that process of state building. And so I, again, just to reiterate it, I do not think that we're going to wake up in a European Union styled uh, Middle East anytime soon. But in order to get there, eventually, we do have to reconcile ourselves with what are national interests and national identities as they continue to form and change as a result of the changes that are unfolding in the wider, in the wider world. Nationalism, as you rightly said, is not just a phenomenon in the Middle East. Um, it's a phenomenon that's spiking everywhere in the world. But we would not look in Italy and ask ourselves, do we still belong in Italy, do we still belong in the European Union, just because some form of nationalism is spiking, or in, well, maybe in the, in, in the UK they did that, but it, it's, um, I think the point is, is that we have to be aware of how to adjust those kinds of ideologies with the states that are emerging and maturing.
Okay, thank you. Eunice, since you're still with us and no one okay. has said anything about China, that's the well, temptation. Okay. Very briefly. Well, China, I see its role at least uh, twofold. One, there is indirect in this conflict uh, being the rising power that could probably reestablish a new sort of a new order in multilateralism, which it has been extremely weakened during the last at least decade, and more and more by uh, the nationalist uh, uh, tendencies of many countries, and especially the US. The more direct role that I see probably in the Middle East, uh, the first example that comes to mind is Lebanon, that we see now more and more talk within the Lebanese circles that they want to move towards the East and maybe have China be, get involved in rebuilding its structure and investment. Uh, if, that's ha if that happens in Lebanon, that means it's gonna happen in the whole uh, Levant region, reaching Iraq, Syria, Yemen, in the Gulf and other regions, that then it can become a major player. So China is definitely there, not directly yet, but it is going to play a role. Thank you very much. I also heard the same in Iran, but that's another discussion. Right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience. We're now going to take half an hour coffee break, so that will be from uh, 14.40 now until 10 past 5. And to the virtual audience, thank you for staying with us. We will resume in half an hour's time. So the conference will be reactivated when we're back at 10 past five. Thank you very much and thank you to the panel.